So I'm going to review today the new dual scope JS220. Brand new, it's only just been released, or well, it's going to be released in the next few days, maybe even. It's very, very new. I've got a beta unit, beta unit, how you want to pronounce it. So this is like a sample, production sample, I suppose. So I want a very few people to get one of these things. So these will be available very soon. So by the time you see this video, I think it will be either just launching or launching in the next few days basically. There'll be links down below to go and check this out. So we've got a couple of things here. We'll look at this box first, get this out of the way. Nice little dual scope sticker. Thank you very much. So this is given to me for the, for free, for the purpose of review. I did show this briefly in mailbag already, and just to show you a bit of what's arrived. So you, you don't need to go and see that again if you're watching this video. You could do if you want, but you don't need to. So here we have a evaluation kit. This is like an extra bit which got sent by this by itself. This is programmable, we can use Python to program it and you can actually generate waveforms and all sorts of stuff. Um, I've already had a little bit of a look at it, that's why it's open. So it's got four banana jacks built onto it. Right, so you see JS220 evaluation kit, so this is meant for the JS220. And basically just plug into the front panel, plug in a USB-C cable, which is supplied. And this will generate some sample waveforms to look on the JS220 so you, you know, learn stuff I suppose. It's also got some GPIO stuff and I don't know something here anyway. I haven't read too much about this thing. I've plugged it in and used it and it does generate a sample waveform for analysis on the JS220. I've actually had a bit of a play around with that and it works fine. This is programmable. So this is actually using Raspberry Pi 2040. Okay that's as close as I can get as you can see that's what's on it. And the other side. Not much to see there. If you actually want to, you can program your own waveforms onto this thing and generate your own waveforms. If you've got like a standardized test setup you want to do, and you've got like a reference waveform you want to use, you could then program this with that waveform in some way. I don't actually know how to do that, but I know it's possible. Then you can use it as a, as a reference waveform to do testing and stuff, I suppose. And this is the waveform it actually puts out in this current state. But yeah, check out the links down below for this thing. So, that's that part. Now let's actually look at the dual scope. So it's got this nice hard shell case. It's got the logo on it as well, look. See? Got the logo. Although it's that way up. I wonder what this cutout's for. I mean, this doesn't quite fit in there. I don't know, is that for front panels maybe? Because you can change front panels on these things. I'm guessing it could be front panels. We've got another USB-C cable to come with it. So you've got one for the EVK kit, it comes with that. And you also get one with the dual scope as well. USB-A to C. Got a little dual scope thank you thing and quick start guide on the back here just tell you how to get it, where you get the software from information about getting started basically um, that's all there like that you can download the manual off the website and everything that's all there have um, a gpio cable with some little pin header things on here like female headers individual pins so you can use this to hook up the gpios which is in hands you can control those with the software we have a another dual scout sticker and we have an allen key in here which i'm in trouble getting out because i've shoved it in the back there we go your Allen key there, which is for changing the front panel. Because the front panel is open source, you can change those. So if you want to reconfigure it to do a different function, instead of having banana jacks like this is currently got, you can actually design your own front panel and swap it out. Or use one that somebody else has already done, they're available. Okay, so let's move the case out of the way for the time being. And here it is, Precision Energy Analyzer. This is an upgrade over the JS110, which has been sold for a little while now. This is the same price as that unit. Price hasn't changed, but this has got better specs and better features. This is a 16-bit vertical resolution instead of a 14-bit on the Bomino version. And it's also got a larger dynamic range on voltage and current. So on this end we've got the GPIO. We've got an LED indicator here, USB-C port, and a trigger in and out. So it's 3.3 volt trigger, 50 ohm 
and it's all reference to USB ground as well as a little note just there. This is actually a PCB material, it's an FR4 plate and on this end is the voltage and current connections. So these you put across your supply to measure the voltage plus or minus 15 volts available, right, so anything within that range, so you can go to minus 15 volts or plus 15 volts anywhere in that 30 volt range. The current is plus or minus 3 amps, so you can go negative 3 amps as well, which is something you couldn't do on the JS110 version. Same with the voltage, you can go negative too much, you can only do a little negative voltage in that one. That's one of the enhancements of this unit is that you can go plus or minus, it doesn't matter. And it can also do a plus or minus 10 amp pulse. So if you've got like a little burst which happens during boot up or something like that, it can handle up to 10 amps initially, for a short time obviously, right? but constant 3 amps maximum and 10 amp pulses. It's got these nice binding posts which are captive, I showed this in the mailbag as well, so these binding posts are captive. These don't fall off if you undo them, you don't, you don't lose them. And you've got some holes through there so if you want to put wires through you can do that instead. And this is obviously just the panel that comes with it. You can get other panels, you can say design your own, there's a template on GitHub where you can download your own front panels. You download front panels other people have designed, or you can use a template and design your own front panel. And you can change this out to say, if you wanted to do USB testing, for example, you could have USB in and out ports on it. You know, A or B or whatever you want to do, C even, you could design your own front panel. And then you can just plug in USB ports instead of having banana jacks, you know, or B and C ports if you want, or whatever you want to do. You could make it do what you want. Um, as long as you're within these voltage and current limits, then no problem at all, you can just change the front panel out. That's what it's designed to do. It's a feature. So these do come with a factory calibration, as you would expect. They also offer this traceable calibration for an extra fee, of course. So yeah, you can actually get a traceable calibration on these things if you need that for business use or whatever. And my unit here was made 21st of September this year, and it's serial number 47. And it's revision A. So I do believe there's actually a slight Hardware revision. The ones that's going to be getting sold, I believe they've got a slight hardware change. I don't remember what it was, but I did see a, a comment somewhere, might be an email, maybe there has been a slight hardware change between this unit and the ones which will be in production, which is natural. When you've got beta units like this, which is basically test samples, things will evolve over time and this design will get improved. So obviously this is a revision A, I'm guessing the production samples might be revision B even. I'd I don't know. Maybe I'll stick with A and just know that the production ones which get sold will be slightly different. It's only a very minor change, I believe. We should power this thing up, plug it in. I was hoping to use this on my Mac. I'll start with some general software information and computer usage information. Right? So this is designed to work on Mac, Windows and Linux. I believe the Linux is just about ready. If it's not ready now, it'll probably be really soon. I know they're working on that system for the actual software to run this thing. So the Mac version requires nothing older than 10.15 is the oldest one it will support because that's the oldest thing that Apple supports currently and backwards compatibility on Mac can be problematic or non-existent even in some cases. Scope, I've been talking with them about this I've been talking to Matt who's the guy that designed this thing I believe about the software support saying it'd be nice to support older systems unfortunately it's not possible because Apple itself doesn't support them backwards compatibility is a problem. 10.15 is the oldest system this will support which is using the version 0.10 software for this thing which is currently in beta testing and stuff, and it's basically ready. It is functional and working. And there's also a version for Mac OS 12, which is available as well, um, which I guess will probably work on 13 as well. For Windows, it works on Windows 10, probably 11 as well. I did try and use this on Windows 7. I was getting some errors and stuff like that, so I couldn't actually get the software to work on Windows 7, unfortunately. I did try it, but it wouldn't work. So Windows 10 works fine. I just installed the software, plugged it in, and it worked. Windows 10 was flawless, so it's not Jaws Scope's fault that my computers are old. <laughs> my old Mac, you know, my old the thing is, I've got an old Mac Pro, right? It's a 2010 Mac Pro, but I've upgraded the CPU and stuff like that, so it's basically maxed out on processor power. It's still a pretty good power horse, really, but unfortunately, Apple was decided to stop supporting that machine, so therefore things get behind. I can't update the latest system software. Like, if I could do 10.15 on that computer, I could use this on it. But that computer can only go to 10.14, annoyingly. Anyway, let's get the laptop set up here and we'll power it up. And I actually have something here we can plug into it and actually hook it up just over here. A nice machine, actually. So I'm going to do a screen capture on here. So hopefully I can play back the screen capture and you'll be able to see it a bit better. Hopefully. So here's the dual scope webpage here. It shows the new unit there. Got downloads here. 
got the software downloads, different versions, also got previous releases. This currently shows us 0.9.11, which is only for the JS11. Um, if you go into other releases, it still shows all the historical ones. And if you want the JS220 currently, which is beta, you have to link over here. And you click on that. And then you've got the different versions here. And um, I'm currently using this version here, 0.10.6 on Windows. So this is the information about it. It's got the price here, which is 999 which is the same as the previous version, despite the upgrades. You can download the user guide here, comparison table, which is a good thing to look at. Basic comparison between the two versions, the previous version and the current version. So bandwidth is 300 kHz now, so 250. ADC bits is 16 now. It's got this in Wavify smooth range switching, which is basically extremely fast switching within the unit for changing the scaling, I believe because it's a really high dynamic range. GPIO's got four to the two. Trigger inputs has got a trigger on it, the other one didn't have that. It's got a software fuse. Software front panel, as we know, as I discussed that before. Open source C driver and Python and Python scripting and its supported systems. Um, this is the current information for how it reads currents. So ENUB or ENOB is 15.1 uh, instead of 12, it wasn't the previous version. And here's the plus and minus 3 and plus and minus 10 maximum currents compared to what the previous one could do. Resolution is now 0.5 nanoamps. Previously it was 1.5 nanoamps. Voltage, donate range is 107 dB instead of 93 like it was before. And same deal, ADC is 16 bit. Output sample rate is 1000. Previous one was, six, was 2000. Not quite sure what that actually refers to anyway. But... Um, Everything else, that's the only thing which looks lower than everything else, but uh, yeah, that's this information. I've already installed the software obviously, and it's, it's a painless install, I just installed it off it, you know, it just worked. I've already got the unit plugged in, have I? Yes, I have. But there we go, we've got some waveforms coming through already. So, obviously, right now it's actually doing nothing. On the unit here, you can see you can see you've got an indicator there, green LED, which means it's sampling. Blue means it's connected, green means it's actually working. And as you can see, we're sampling right now just random data. So let's actually plug in the evaluation board. And you'll see this also runs off USB C. So let's plug it into the other port on the other side of the unit. Okay, so that's the unit plugged in. That's running off the evaluation board now. And you can see the sample waveforms this is generating. So we can actually change the displays. We can zoom in quite a bit here. And you can see it scrolling across. And you can zoom in quite a lot. If you want to stop capturing, just push this. Now stop capturing. And you can zoom in some more. If there's something in particular you want to look at. I believe we can drag this around. Yes we can. So if you want to look at this section here, we can zoom in some more. Even though it's stopped, we can do it. Right, you can also see there's a little glitch just here, see this? So if you look at the time scale across here, so it's 19.598 here, through to 19.612 there. This is in seconds. 20 milliseconds across there. It would actually be nice if this said milliseconds as well, rather than seconds, because when we get zoomed in this far, it should really say milliseconds per division or something like that just to be in the same format as oscilloscopes and stuff like that, I suppose. I think it'd just be nicer. We also have this one here, which allows you to zoom out fully, gives you the full capture. So everything that's captured so far will be there. Obviously I've played this already. When you first start this thing up, it's actually defaults to showing you the multimeter view. So if we go to views, we've got multimeter view here. Normally it just has this showing up before the scope. So actually, I'll, I'll show you the full thing. So when you first start it up, it'll be this view. Right, just this view like this, giving you raw readings. Now, you can change the view to be the oscilloscope. And I've still got the multimeter on. And you can also turn the thing on and off and things like that. So turn the GPIO on and off, which you can control. It's down the bottom there. It's just... Uh, 
hide the multimeter again, turn it back off. So let's get this in capture in again, right now it's sitting there. And you've got GPIO here, you can control these things, you can turn it on and off. As required, you've got a system little with voltage over here, so 1.8 volts to 5 volts is the range you can use there. Um, so those are the outputs, so these are inputs, you can see if the inputs are active or not. It's actually really easy to pick up this software. So it's different views, I'm currently showing current, voltage and power. You can turn off any one of those if you want. So if I turn off power, that will then show us current and voltage only. Okay. Um, you can also do this one here, which is the range, current range. So you can see how it's changing ranges. We'll do power as well if you we want. Um, we can turn on the GPIO inputs to one or two of those as well if you we want. So I've got everything turned on now. Give it a second to catch up. This isn't a particularly fast computer. So then you can monitor the GPIO at the same time. So if you've got something going on here, you can actually see how that relates to these other measurements as well. So I'll turn off some of this stuff, I don't need everything running. And you can close things with crosses down here too. You can use the menu or you can use the crosses. So you've got current range auto, you can change what range you want to have on the current ranging. So if you want to get closer into a small signal, you can manually do that and ignore anything that goes over range. Obviously this is auto scaling right now as well. In a particular state it is anyway. You've got markers, so you can do markers on it. So you can want to check between certain things, you know, time frames or vertical resolutions as well I think. So you can see minimax and values there, and you can turn those off or you can do a full as well if you want to do a fill. So you can see what looks like noise, which is probably a more accurate representation really. Or you can turn them off completely and just not have them, and still get the raw value. So the software was really easy to pick up. I just sat down and started using it. It's like, well, that's actually pretty easy. Also got settings over here. You can tap on that. You can add settings, current range, and stuff like that. But that's exactly the same as doing these over here. Does the same, it's kind of superfluous really, doesn't really need to be there. Tools up here, accumulation, statistics, you can record those, you can show those, you can choose which device, you've got multiple devices hooked up. Your preferences pane here, let's open that up. Lots of options in here. Can I expand this? I can, I think. Count settings, units, so the energy, energy in joules. Or watt hours. For me, watt hours is probably a more relevant factor. I don't tend to use joules for anything, but yeah. Accumulation energy or charge, so again, it comes under joules really. So it's auto stream, which is what it's doing right now. Automatically do firmware updates as well. So many frequencies, you can probably slow it down or reduce it. I think 2 megahertz is the maximum, but maybe you want to slow it down because you want to catch less samples because you're doing it over a long period of time. Maybe you're doing logging or something. Current ranging. I don't know what this does yet. I haven't looked at it. Appearance, dark theme appearance stuff. You've got different colours and change your colour theme if you want. It's got widgets. I don't know if I really need to worry about those. And waveform stats as well. And you can configure the waveform slightly. So it can do recording. I haven't tried this yet, so I've done it to a CSV file apparently. I'll just dump it at the desktop for now. And it will hopefully be recording this waveform into a CSV. That's the plan anyway. So next I think we'll look at an actual device rather than just this test board. Right, so I'm just about ready to do this test now. I've got this set up for power, current, and voltage measurement. This is all auto scale. This is the device I'm going to test. I've got it hooked up to basically the power section. It's got a battery pack in here. I'm bypassing the battery pack and the BMS system and bypassing that. So basically, I'm putting power straight into the microcontroller and the actual unit. Okay. This is the hook test setup. So I've got a Pomona cable here, which is running straight to my power supply. That's supplying 8 volts DC. I've got a link between the positives here, so I'm passing the current through from this link to this link 
and this is doing positive current through here. This cable here is going to the power supply for the microcontroller. This black wire here is obviously the negative going to the microcontroller also. Okay, that's the connection set up. All I've got to do is actually push the power button on my um, power supply over here and we'll start seeing data and it will turn it on and we'll see what's going on. So I get to it first, power supply on, and you'll see straight away it's jumped and it's logging it just there and it's showing a boot up sequence. Now if I push the green button here, that should now try and use LoRa. And that's the small pulses there, trying to use LoRa to request data across the network, which is currently not running. So we can actually analyze those current spikes. There we go, look at that. So we can see exactly what's going on there when it's trying to activate LoRa. And if I do a reset, it will force another one, which might change the sequence slightly. Yeah, it does, there we go. So those pulses are trying to basically access the network. What it may actually do is it might actually turn on Wi-Fi if it can't find it quickly enough. It does try for a period of time. I can't have got Wi-Fi turn on or not. This is using ESP32. And that's what's controlling this whole device. So let's actually see if we can get a closer look at this current. So this is in milliamps. Let's look at the voltage range here. It shows 8 volts coming in. We're seeing those spikes here and a power usage here as well. So what I actually might do is power this back down again, enable logging. I'll go back to the full view. Now I don't know if it means we'll lose detail or not. So let's zoom in a bit. Stop it and zoom in. Now I'll look at the detail here when we're zoomed in. There's still quite a lot of detail even in that. So even on this, I'm still zooming in. And you can see ringing going on there. Look at that. So even though I was doing a capture quite a fair way out, you can see that kind of level of detail. So let's keep going in. On in and the output of that waveform, you can see it. Big surge, inrush current there. How close we can get. Look at that. It's like 2 milliseconds per division. So we're seeing an inrush here of about 1.6 uh, milliamps. Sorry, that's wrong. See an inrush there, I've got some dust on the screen. <laughs> So an inrush there of 160 milliamps when it's first switching. That's quite nice to know. So let's power this up now. I think I'm doing logging now. I think I'm logging. So let's do another power up. And we'll see how this comes. I actually did zoom in a lot on this thing. I'm currently zoomed back out to full scale again. But I actually zoomed right in on that x-axis and it just keeps on going. It's amazing how much detail it can show. All right, let's do this. And there's those little pulses trying to contact the LoRa server. And this will change in a second once it goes out of range. It'll scale up. There we go. Now we can see some more detail. Okay, so let's pause this. And we'll zoom in a lot. Yeah, the trackpad thing's not helping. There we go. There. Zoom into that. So you can see there's little drops in current. I'm more interested in the starting side of it, this bit here. That's what I'm interested in. And we'll just keep zooming in. It just keeps on going. It's incredible. The resolution, this thing's really, really good. And here you can see the noise in the ADC, most likely. Or ambient noise, maybe, actually. It's probably just ambient noise. But it's interesting to see this voltage dipping very slightly like this. When it's under load. And we can still keep going in. Here we go. I think we're getting down to the point where it's getting ridiculous. <laughs> but, but yeah, there you go. That's uh, microseconds per division. We'll set 10 microseconds per division, something like that. So yeah, that's pretty good resolution. I think we might be able to go more. Yeah, we can. There we go, that's the limit, that's as far as we can go. 10 microseconds per division. But that's still impressive. Wow. So when I was doing that last capture, I was doing this logging on here. And I've just, she just opened the log file. So I'm not doing any capture right now. 
I actually quit the program and I've reopened it and I've opened this log file up. So the actual capture we were doing has been recorded and you can actually view it within Joelscope. And you can, you know, do what you're doing before, zoom in right in. And, you know, we can look at different bits. Now this has got those big current spikes on it at the start and the voltage spikes from the very initial power up. So it's reduced the scaling a little bit from what we can see. So current range, there you go, it rescaled itself. So even though it's a past capture, it will still scale itself to give you the best view on screen. So even though this is recorded data, it can still do it and just replay basically what you saw live. That's really nice. So I think those are the initial power-up stuff before I started doing the law capture or law data sending. It's obviously processing a lot of data because it's struggling a bit with it. It's got a lot of data to deal with. Especially as I'm doing recording, there we go. There's those spikes we're looking for. All right. So that's exactly what we saw before on the live view. 160 milliamp spike. Excellent. That works beautifully. I'll have a play with it. Let's open it up and have a look. So it does have a replaceable front panel. So this is actually meant to come off if you want to change your configuration. So you strengthen those then going right into the casing. That's good. So I've got the screws out. Now I actually think the whole thing will slide out. Yes it will. There we go. Perfect. And there's the inside. So there's a the front panel set up. Let's take the rubber bung off. And there's a the front panel. So will that front panel actually fit inside there? It will. Yes. So that's what that cutout's for, is for storing front panels. Nice. And it basically has a plug-in adapter. So we'll unplug that. There we go. Little pin header. Design your own front panel if you want and put it on there. So we've got some light pipes on there. Got a lattice FPGA. Lots of stuff going on there. Got some unpopulated test headers I'm guessing. There you go. There's the whole board. There's a lot going on this thing. This is why they're not cheap. They're still cheaper than commercial options though. If you were to try and get a commercial option of someone that did this, I think you'd be paying a lot more money than this. In fact, I'm not even aware of anything that can do this. There's nothing else I've got here which can do what this can, can do. You know, even my decent oscilloscope and stuff can't do the same sort of detail this has got on it. Same dynamic range and what have you. And that's what's on the back. I could go through and look at every single part on the board, but I'm not going to do that. What I will do is let you have a close look at it. If there's anything on that board which interests you, you can probably get the numbers off yourself. Alright, so there's some AD S is that or was it AD59? AD59226. Right in the middle there, obviously analog digital converters, there we go. That's better. That lighting's better. OPA is there. Just trying different angles, get different lighting on it so you can try and get the numbers. Maybe help someone one day. From being this close, it's really hard to get the camera focused at the same time. Atmel processor over there as well. There's the power supply section over here. I think I've done the whole board. So thanks a lot Matt for sending that to me to have a look at. Awesome piece of test gear. If you're looking for something which can do these precision measurements like this and these really fine details, I think you basically need one of these things. I mean, yes it's a thousand dollars, but try getting something else that can do this. There isn't anything out there, um, at least not for this price point. I mean, maybe you can get something for tens of thousands of dollars, I don't know. I'm not familiar with anything else. This is the only thing I've seen in this kind of price bracket that can really do this kind of thing. You know, if you really want to look at these precision details, then you probably want to get yourself one of these. So check the links out down below. Thanks a lot, Matt, for sending this to me at no cost. Much appreciated. And I'll uh, check out my other videos here, other reviews and what have you. Catch you later. Bye. Not much to see there. Cough a bit when you drop it.